Justin Kramer. Nice to see you. Mary from Next Next Chapter Radio Network is here. Uh, James Frazier, nice to see you. Her Majesty BRC, what's up? Byron, how we doing? Brian, sorry. Why do I keep calling you? You must be so mad, man. Anyways, Elaine, how are you tonight? Everyone is coming on. Everyone is uh, trickling on into the stream. Want to welcome everybody to the show. Want to thank everyone for tuning in yesterday to hear about how to discern prophetic dreams and visions. And we talked about uh, that Dana Coverstone's Three Prophetic Dreams for America. So if you want to know more about that, check out our uh, video archives. It was yesterday's broadcast. Uh, Joseph, how are you doing? Froggy, Evie, Bernadette, thank you for joining us this evening. God bless. Welcome, everyone. We're going to take a moment and pray for the broadcast before we start. Thank you, Brian, for forgiving me. Ophelia Doom, what's up? Nice to see you, Miss Jamie Wooley. Uh, got an hour to chill in the chat. That's cool. Uh, Pam, how are you doing? Watchman on the pod. Thank you for joining us this evening. Father, we give this broadcast to you. We ask that you guard everyone who's listening. We ask that you enlighten our minds to the truth that we are about to hear tonight, Lord God. Lord, may we speak things of value of an, and of importance to people's hearts, minds, souls this evening. Lord, protect us from any satanic interference, any satanic movement, any satanic infiltration or disruption. Father, have your way in this moment. Thank you for everything that you're about to do. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Father, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to rescue and redeem us from sin. We love you. We give you all the praise and the glory in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. D, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope everyone is doing good. I am super excited tonight, not only to take a drink of this awesome tea. Not a sponsor of this tea or of this show, but uh, Snapple puts out a diet uh, tea called Raka Tra or Trapa Raka. Brett Michaels, poison man, he brewed this flavor of tea. Diet tea, got some mango, got some, I believe, some peach in there, got some pear in there, and some cinnamon. And believe it or not, cinnamon is the play when drinking diet iced tea. Yes, Snapple again. So, yeah. Jeremy's like, hey, man, we ain't here to talk about tea. We're here to talk about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> uh, all right, so... If uh, you don't know Mr. Jeremy Anderson, you should. Um, he has an amazing, amazing show, The Remnant Reports. Uh, he's on the next next chapter, Radio Network with Mary Callie. Um, big fan of this guy's show. I tune in whenever I can. A lot of times we uh, compete time-wise slot, but I'm always up to catching it on the rebroadcast. Uh, this is a young man of God who probably isn't that young, but at least he's not totally gray like me. And he stands a little bit. Yeah. A little bit, man. Um, yeah. He stands for Bible truth, man, in a generation that's sorely lacking Bible truth and standards of righteousness. Andrew, how are we doing tonight? Thank you for joining us. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a very, very important subject. We're going to be talking about a spiritual worldview. Um, I said this uh, a few podcasts ago during a communion service. Hi, Jennifer. How are you doing tonight? I said that we always are fighting this God's not dead notion. All the universities and all the atheists are like, hey, that God is dead. God's dead. And we're all like, God's not dead, so he's surely alive. And then we sing a little bit of the newsboys to him. 
And uh, we're happy about that. But the Bible prophesies that there's coming an hour upon the earth where all men will worship the devil or they'll worship Yahweh. It's one of the two. That's the purpose of the tribulation is to actually draw that dividing line in the sand. It's this world's two-minute warning, man. And the Bible says that all of those who do not believe in Yahweh, do not believe in God, will be struck in by the beast. They'll, they'll be like, oh my goodness, who can make war with this guy? This guy is amazing. And then it says that they'll actually worship the beast. They'll worship the image of the beast. They'll worship alongside the false prophet who will deceive many by lying signs and wonders. During the tribulation, there will be no more atheists. Atheism will be dead, not God will be dead. Because everybody will have a supernatural worldview. Because the devil will make certain of it. And while we in the Christian church have the power of the Holy Spirit, the enemy has another power. And it manifests itself in a lot of ways, in a lot of terms, in a lot of different jargon and lingo. But one of them is Kabbalah. And it's actually almost all of them are Kabbalah because it ties into everything. And... uh this Jewish mysticism. We're going to talk about some controversial stuff tonight, and I'm glad I have Mr. Anderson on here to do it with me. Before I let Mr. Anderson talk, I'm trying to be formal. He knows that we shouldn't be that formal, but I want to get all the introduction stuff out of the way while people are coming in so we can get to the meat of the show in a couple minutes. Um, this right here, is Jeremy's new book. This book just came out on the Kindle today. It's called Origins of Evil Book One. There's going to be more than one book. And this book deals with the Kabbalah. I'm like 70, 80% done reading it ahead of time. He was nice enough to give me a free copy. And it's good. It's good. You don't have to be a master theologian to read it. You just have to love the Lord, man. And it's not one of these things that's like super long. It's it's power packed, nice and tight. Uh, not a lot of fat on the bones, just a lot of meat. And really describes some of the origins of evil, Kabbalah. Uh, it has a whole chapter on the golem, which we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm excited to talk about that. So Froggy wants to know what... Uh, Kabbalahism, Ophelia Doom says it's Jewish mysticism in a nutshell. We're going to let Jeremy Anderson explain this to us, but I just wanted to show everyone that right now you can go to Amazon. You can get yourself a copy of this Kindle book for $9.99. If you have Kindle Unlimited, uh, Jeremy was really cool enough to make it part of the Kindle Unlimited package and give you guys the option of reading it for free. And if you guys are like, shine this Kindle stuff, Monday you'll have a hard copy available to order. If you want to order this book, you can go to the Amazon and type in Jeremy Anderson or Origins of Evil Book One Kabbalah. Or you can go to the description in this video. Just go down to that little description area. And it's going to say, buy Jeremy Anderson's new book. And you just click on that link and it'll take you to the link, that, the page that you're seeing right there. All right, Mr. Anderson, how are we doing tonight? We're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, excited to be on here with you and uh, talk about the book, uh, but really more excited for people to, you know, get the information that they need. Because uh, this thing's really, people, just, they just don't realize how much it is entrenched in uh mainstream Christianity. Um, it, it's infiltrated its way into the churches, um, you know, through things like Hebrew Roots Movement and uh, Messianic Judaism and Dispensationalism as well. Um, I think a lot of people innocently enough don't, don't realize what it is they're they're taking a part in but you know we're especially as believers we're responsible um, 
to know these things, uh, especially when there are these these dark practices. You know, a lot of people get into the whole gematria stuff, and, and a lot of people <laughs> really buy other people's books. Books are a big way people uh, get into it. They start following authors who write Christian um, books on the Bible, commentaries. Some of them are fiction. Um, a lot, you know, there's some big name authors. I talk about some of it in the book. Uh, you know, and my, my goal was not to try to badmouth anybody. Um, but at the same time, you know, I feel we have a responsibility to, to warn our brothers and sisters if we we see something dangerous that could take them on a path that could lead them to falling away. Um, you know, we talked Wednesday night in the discipleship class we had on uh, the Next Chapter Radio Network about the falling away. And um, talk, I read... Um, in Mark chapter four, the parable of the seeds, you know, Jesus was talking about the sowing of the seeds and, you know, it really goes into the falling away. Unless, unless we are that good ground, um, uh, that, that seed takes hold in, um, uh, then we are going to, to fall away at the first sign of persecution, you know, uh, just like Jesus said, but, uh, to answer the question earlier, yes, uh, uh, Kabbalah is definitely Jewish mysticism. Um, you know, it, it slow it really has its its roots all the way back to antediluvian times, pre-flood times, with the fallen watchers and the Nephilim. You know, people worship them, and um, then you know, even after the flood. They worship the, the gods of the nations, the Gentile nations. And, um, of course, Israel, we know they were they were in Egypt. They were enslaved in Egypt. And um, then eventually they were in the land of Canaan. And it seems like just everywhere they went, they would, they would pick up traditions of and uh, customs and really religious practices of the, the Canaanites and, uh, you know, all of the, the mystery religions. One of one of the books, and it's actually a series, uh, Brian Gadawa's series um, on the Chronicles of the Nephilim, his, his newest one especially, uh, the um, Chronicles of the Watchers, his uh, Jezebel book, where it talks about, um, you know, how they had the Asherah worship and then brought in the, the Temple of Baal, you know, it's a fiction book, but it's true fiction. You know, it, it's the actual history of, of what happened. And, you know, that, the Israel and then eventually the, the nation of Judah adopted these practices. And um, then uh, around the time of, uh, I guess, about the Maccabees, they... Um, started with the, the Merkaba mysticism, you know, the where they would try to have these mystical visions uh, or try to make themselves have the, the same vision Ezekiel had. And uh, it, it was it was like a secret practice. It was just practiced among a few and then it just kind of took root and took hold and uh, you know, by Jesus' day, it was the practice of the Pharisees. And uh, we know the Pharisees eventually uh, turned after the temple was destroyed. You know, they really were responsible for rabbinic Judaism. And uh, slowly over the course of time, uh, for the most part, rabbinic Judaism from uh, the Jewish sages and mystics, they really, uh, it, the mysticism turned into the, the most part of rabbinic Judaism. And it's bled over into Christianity. You know? But I talk about that a lot in different chapters of the book, you know, how the Jesuits, um, 
were formed and you know they they have a lot to do with the infiltration into the the church but a lot of people don't realize that you know the jesuits um, were actually formed by uh the the jewish converts people that that were forced to convert to Catholicism, not Christianity. Of course, they called it Christianity, but it was Catholicism. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of people, I guess, especially if they're watching the Omega Frequency or listening to the Omega Frequency, I'm sure they know just how much the Jesuits are responsible for. But, uh, you know, we, I know we're going to talk a little while about the Gala, but, you know, right now the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church, was the head of the Jesuits, so uh, you know that could that could really turn out to be something there. Yeah. Hey, man, uh, we've been having some comments in the chat. Is it possible that you can turn up the microphone on your computer a little bit? Yeah. Let me uh, say what. I, I know what I'm going to do. Give me just a second. I'm gonna. I'm gonna I've turned it up. I'm going to cut this air conditioning off. Okay. If I cut this air off and I get closer to the mic, it actually uh, may get a little louder. Uh, actually, that sounds a million times better. Can you tilt the screen up, though, so we can see your face a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Now try it again. Say something. Is that better? I think so. Just just uh, talk for a couple seconds. And, uh, well, actually, we'll ask this question. Uh, Ophelia Doom says, I have a question if it's not too soon to ask. It's about protective circles. Uh, bear with us while we, uh, there we go. Are you still there, sir? Yeah, I'm here. All right. I was cool. trying to fix the screen. Is that better? Can you see me better? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, can you still get a little closer? Oh, yeah. This yeah. way? Yeah. Now I'll try. I'll try talking. Okay. Um, what was the question again that she asked? Okay. Um, you might be able to see it on the screen if you're looking at the screen. It says, I have a question if it's not too soon to ask. It's about protective circles and how they were started. Why do messianics dance in a circle to keep evil spirits out? Everyone's like uh, way better on the sound quality and the, the stuff. So yeah, I thank see you, that sir. Now I didn't have the chat pulled up. I've got it pulled up now, though. I see uh, it's Ophelia Doom's question, correct? Yes. Um, you know it. It's a mystical practice. Um, there, that that is uh, the the big thing um, is customs. There, customs of men. Um, you know, you know, even even the <laughs> the part of rabbinic Judaism that has nothing to do with mysticism, the um, Talmudic part, um, the oral Torah, that is, in the oral law, that's it's, it's really just customs of men and. Uh, it's what it's what Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for, uh, one of the things anyway. But uh, actually, as far as the dancing around in circles, um, I've never actually heard of that specific practice. Um, it, it could be a Kabbalistic practice. There are so many, and there's so many different um, Kabbalistic books. Uh, you know, I, I wrote about them in the the book, you know, the in the chapter on um, the history of the Kabbalah, I, you know, I tried to uh, start from the, the beginning, but I didn't want to put too much information in there that made it hard for people to read or, you know, make people get bored and want to put it down. So I, I tried to put as much information as I could in you know, it's, it, I, like you said, I tried to pack a lot into a little bit of space and um, hopefully it worked out OK. But, you know, it, it started out not even being called Kabbalah. It was just, you know, it was the mysticism um, 
you know, we, we now can look back and call it Merkaba mysticism and, um, give it the titles. Uh, but, um, Merkaba just means chariot. You know, it was the, the, the wheels, the Othanum from, um, Ezekiel's vision. And, uh, you know, it, it, the book of, the book of Enoch talks about the Othanum, um, as a type of, of, of angelic being, um, you know, that they're actually, uh, uh, a uh, heavenly being, you know, not just, uh, a chariot or a wheel as we would see it but uh yeah that as far as the dancing in circles uh they they do believe in in evil spirits um and of course we do too but you know we know that uh the only way to uh, protect ourselves from unclean spirits is by uh the armor of god you know we have you have to have christ and you have to have that armor on uh, dancing in circles is definitely not going to protect you. Yeah, and I think a lot of it does go back to the Jewish mysticism of the circles and the chariot wheels and the wheels within a wheel and a very specific angel they're trying to invoke for protection. And um, you can trace a lot of that back to the Talmud and things like that. And the dangerous part about it is we're not to invoke angels. We're not to ask angels to come and protect us. God sends them on that assignment. We're to go to God. God has all the power. We're to go to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to uh, wake angels up or sound shofar horns to wake angels up, as they teach in some New Apostolic Reformation churches and some Messianic New Apostolic Reformation churches. We go to God. We make sure our relationship is good with God. We don't have to worry about our relationship with angels. We don't assign angels. We don't have to invoke them. We can walk. And I believe in guardian angels. Um, I know Jeremy believes in guardian angels because Amen. like, he's here tonight because he has some guardian angels looking out for him. Um, but we just trust that if we're in the right relationship with Jesus and the blood of Jesus is covering us, we don't need a circle. We don't need an action. We don't need a horn blast or anything like that. So let's let's dive deep into this subject, man. So where do you think specifically uh, this Kabbalah started off? And is Kabbalah, I guess another question, this is probably a better question, actually. If you take like witchcraft, right, or the New Age movement, that's a very loose thing. Like there's there's like things that everyone agrees are part of the new age and a part of witchcraft. There are certain books that everybody agrees are really important to read. But when it comes down to the practice of the new age or practice of witchcraft or even the practice of Satanism, there's a lot of homebrew. Like that's a good term that I think you used. There's a lot of uh, personalization and customization that goes on with this. You add your own kind of spells. You keep your own kind of grimoire or your own kind of book of shadows. And you tailor make things. Even in the new age, you know, it's about these personal connections that you make with a higher consciousness. Is new age or is, the, is Kabbalah more of a dogmatic thing like Islam where it's rigid in its practices? Or is it more of like a build your own religion with mystical nuts and bolts that you can place wherever you want. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's um, Kabbalah actually encompasses all of the mystery religions and their practices into one. And in chapter six in the book, uh, chapter is actually called uh, Aleister Crowley, Secret Societies and Other Forms of the Cult Based on the Kabbalah. And in that chapter, I talk about um, Crowley's uh, Hermetic Kabbalah. You know, he used Kabbalah to form uh, his magic and his uh, his sexual magic. And a lot of people don't realize just how much uh, sexual language and uh, actually practices are in the Zohar, um, you know, it, it, the 
hermaphrodite male female god um just like the um it comes from the zohar you know just like the uh baphomet that that is the exact same way that they portray god as uh both male and female but um you know the the new age movement uh, i talk about alice bailey in that chapter um Helena Blavatsky, um, although her her um, theosophy was, you know, based more on Gnosticism, but they uh, they both use the same practices, and um, we know that pretty much all of today's witchcraft is based on Crowley's uh, practices. You know, he is pretty much the father of modern witchcraft. Um, especially for the left-handed path, but uh, even the, the right-handed path um, use a lot of, uh, of Crowley's um, spells and practices and tactics. But yeah, it is uh, it is definitely a, a build-your-own-religion type of thing. And it is the framework for literally almost every esoteric secret society that there is. Um, you know, the Golden Dawn, the Freemasons, uh, the Masons are the most Kabbalistic secret society I believe I can think of. And um, I, I truly believe, and you and I have talked about this, I believe that uh, Kabbalah will be the framework for the one world religion that will come from the beast system. Um, because you're able to add these mystical practices and kind of build your own religion. And, um, you know, I, we did a program several weeks back on the Remnant Report, uh, um, and it was called the uh, End Times Kabbalist of the Pope. And uh, it's talking about the, the, the Kabbalistic um, sorcery that, is done within the Jesuits and inside the Vatican. And, um, you know, the, one of the big things in Kabbalah is the, the female goddess, you know, the, 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 the God and the goddess of the mysteries. And um, we know that uh, Roman Catholicism has added that into to their religion as well with the Mary worship. And um, <laughs> there is a, there's not many um, occult practices or societies that does not uh, bring Kabbalah into them in one way or another. And, uh, you know, I, I talked about in uh, another chapter of the book as far as should, it's called Should Christians Practice Kabbalah? And it's about the infiltration of the church and uh, I, I actually talk about the the same uh, the NRA and the word of faith churches um, the super charismatic churches out uh, you know in California and um, their practices of invoking angels and uh, grave soaking and all of these mystical practices that the Bible absolutely forbids in the Old Testament and, you know, these are really, really dark practices. That, that is the bottom line. And I, I don't think people really understand how dangerous this stuff is. Uh, what are some of the things that churches, because you, you wrote the chapter uh, talking about should Christians practice Kabbalah, and obviously Christians would be like, no, we should never practice Kabbalah. I mean, even if you ask the people at Bethel who grave soak and do all this other stuff, if we should practice Kabbalah, they would probably even say, no, you shouldn't practice Kabbalah. Um, but yet they do. What are some specific ways? Can you give me three or four specific things that Christians are doing that they might be surprised to learn are Kabbalic in nature? Um i tell you one thing that I, well, I can tell you several things, like you said, three or four, but you see it all over Facebook. Um, 
where people are talking about the female Ruach and um, that the Holy Spirit is female. And this is really, um, I've heard it in, I've heard people talking about this in mainstream churches, uh, people that I know that uh, go to their non-denominational, um, I guess they would fall in the category as charismatic, but, you know, they talk about the Holy Spirit being feminine. And in the Southern Baptist Church, where I grew up in, I can remember many times the pastor talking about the Shekinah glory of God. That is absolutely Kabbalistic. The Shekinah, also. The Shekinah is the female um, it is, it's not the female name for God in the, in the Kabbalah, but it's the, the name of the manifestation of the female aspect of God from the, the Sephirot tree. You know, the Sephirot tree has, uh, has 10 aspects of God and, uh, at the, the bottom, the Shekinah is the the manifestation of the female aspect of God. And there is no female aspect of God, but this, this is, you know, the Kabbalistic doctrine. And it, that is one of the ways that it's crept into the church. Now, this is the Southern Baptist Church, which is one of, what well, no, it's not one of, it is the biggest denomination in the United States. And um, whether they realize that they're talking about the, the female manifestation of God when they call the Holy Spirit Shekinah, they are. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that to me, and I think I, you may agree or disagree with this, but to me, that's no different than the Israelites worshiping the golden calf, um, thinking that it was okay, you know, trying to worship God their way. You know, even even if God's not going to honor that, um, he's just not. And there's another way is uh, and this is actually Gnosticism. But like I said, Gnosticism and Kabbalah are really entwined because it's the, the same thing. It's the female aspect of God. There's there are so many um, authors that talk about the female aspect of God in, in their books. I don't really want, we're on YouTube. If we were just on, on my program, I would feel fine saying names, but I'm not going to on yours because. Uh, you can name as many names as you want on our show, sir. We don't yeah. care. We're not monetized and we will name names. You know, um, one of the biggest uh, in mainstream Christianity, one of the biggest uh, authors and teachers that bring in Kabbalistic doctrine and, and teachings is Jonathan Kahn. <laughs> and a lot of people, I mean, he, he's on Skywatch TV. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people raise this guy up. You know, I know many people who are. Uh, the harbinger, the harbinger, the harbinger. All I used to hear was the harbinger. And, you know, so I read it and then I read the paradigm and I was like, my goodness. Um, and so then I went and I researched and, you know, you can actually find um, videos on YouTube of Jonathan Kahn preaching from the Zohar and uplifting it. Um, you know, he, uh, he, as he's gotten bigger, and gotten more interested in, in, in my opinion, in making money than uh, pushing Kabbalistic doctrine. He's he's made it more subtle, but it's it's there, um, you know, with the gematria and the codes. Um, all of that is is, is mysticism. Uh, but it, this wasn't that long ago. Uh, on his website, there was. Um, actually quotes from the Zohar, Kabbalistic quotes from the Zohar, which is the main book in the Kabbalah. Um, you know, there, there are 
three books in 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 the Kabbalah that are are people that people know of the most. Um, the Sefer Yetzira would be the first book, and actually, when the Sefer Yetzira came out, it, it wasn't even called Kabbalah at that time. It was just mysticism. Um, and then by the time the the Zohar came out, um, it was actually called Kabbalah. Then you know it, that was you know during the Middle Ages. Uh, 1400s around that time um that's when it, you know it, it got named kabbalah but the book of third enoch is um a kabbalistic book uh it was r written by a rabbi who rejected jesus christ and this christ rejecting rabbi then um actually was a was approached you know he he saw a fallen angel who who gave him the words to write in third Enoch and, you know, third Enoch is where Metatron comes from. And Metatron of course is in the Zohar. Metatron is um, on the, the Sephirot tree, you know, and that's, that's another one of the big things. Um, uh, Messianic rabbi, it's Shapira in his book, um, the kosher pig that, that, that book is, oh my goodness, it's uplifted by so many, not just in the Messianic community, also big churches, uh, mega pastors that are on TV, you know, they're uplifting this, this book that Yeshua is Metatron. That is, that is another way that it's coming into the church, people believing that Yeshua is metatron and you know that that is um an absolute lie uh metatron is in my opinion uh a fallen angel that that's all metatron is is, is just a fallen angel and i i truly believe that some some people like uh messianic rap which the term messianic rabbi is really an oxymoron you know jesus yeshua said call no man rabbi um and uh i'm not saying that that all messian all messianics are kabbalist or follow kabbalah by any means i have friends that are messianics i have close friends that consider their, themselves hebrew roots and um you know I, I'm not saying that that they aren't believers or that all of them believe this Kabbalistic teachings. I know a lot of them that reject it and, you know, hate the fact that it's around them. And, you know, a lot of them or I know several of them that truly believe that they can change it from the inside. But um, I just hope that they don't go down with the sinking ship um, because it's it, – Literally, I have seen so many people, brother, that have started off with good intentions and gone from that to rejecting Jesus Christ as God, because that's another <laughs> that that Jesus is not God. He is he's the Messiah. He's the son, but he's not God. You know, um, they they reject the Trinity. That is that is a. Uh, where it leads to um i've seen it time and time again and um you know when i started waking up and seeing some of the the pagan things going on in, inside the mainstream church and really the biggest thing that and the reason that i i left the southern baptist church was the freemasonry inside the church you know um I found out that the church I grew up in had a, a, a master Freemason as the pastor. And this was, you know, the man who I had looked up to my whole life uh, growing up. And uh, so I, I was really turned off by the, the mainstream denominations. And I almost got sucked into that, that Hebrew roots movement uh, because there is a, a lot of truth there, but it, it, it's like the, the um poo in the punch bowl scenario you know just just a, li a little bit of a poison uh inside of the punch will kill you 
Um, you know, you can have rat poison is another good example. 99% of rat poison is good. Um, just that 1% is what kills you. It's what kills the mice. And um, that's, that's really the big thing. Um, <laughs> there are uh, several authors, um, several teachers. Uh, of course, we all know Bill Johnson at, uh, at Redding, uh, the um, church in Redding, California, uh, Bethel. They, um, I believe they are probably the most mystical <laughs> church there is they're they're kind of set apart but they they bring a lot of that into their church even though they don't call it these things and you know i've never heard them talk about the female holy spirit but they definitely invoke angels and um, they have the the spirit boards and the grave soaking and you know they're they're nar all the way um well they also totally believe in the Kabbalistic practice of words have power, words have purpose, words have creative forces. Um, we have a couple questions about this in the chat. Uh, do most Kabbalah practitioners believe God is a verb and the spark? And Shalom Girl says they're reading the book, The Secret, at their women's Bible study. So let's just take a second and address the this first. Secret. Um, I'm not familiar with The Secret. The, Are you... the Secret's a uh, best-selling New Age book. It's like the law of attraction, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And it's not even a Christian book. It, um, it's straight up uh, law of attraction. So yeah. basically, Kabbalah holds to the theory that if Yahweh created the world using words, then Hebrew words have mystical powers to them. So yeah. do the the alphabet so like if you can speak with the creative force and use these words in certain combinations or make these faith-filled proclamations or if you're a little god and you reach that state of enlightenment the things that you speak can also have creative powers too the word of faith movement and their name it and claim it thing the secret which is the law of attraction God is a verb, but all of these things are Kabbalistic by sheer definition. Shalom, girl. I don't know what kind of a, a church you're going to, or if this is a private women's Bible study, but please, please, for the love of God, pray and use discernment about studying that or studying from that book. That book is not even Christian. It is completely law of attraction and it's, it's a, uh, it's name it and claim it, basically new age on steroids. It is. I uh, I see in the chat somebody uh, who was it uh, asked about Zen Garcia and Rob Skiba. Um, I actually wrote about Zen Garcia in the book. I didn't name his book because I didn't want him to get any any. Um, I didn't want him to make any money off of my book because I named his book. So I didn't quote him word for word or name his book, but in Zen Garcia's book, in the very beginning, in the dedication, he dedicates his book to uh, the Tetragrammaton, the father. Uh, Yish, uh, I think it says Yeh Yehosha, the son, and Barbello, the Holy Spirit. Well, mm. Barbello is the the female god or goddess excuse me um of gnosticism and it's also uh the the female it, it's it's a nicolaitan practice you know and and jesus talks about hating the the nicolaitans um they believed in and worshiped barbello and that's you know as goddess worship um the the mother goddess worship and or the shack the shack has a female yeah. holy spirit Absolutely. lord and daigle comes right out and says i am so blessed that they made the father a mother a, a woman and especially the holy spirit a woman. and it is i mean th thank you um the shack I, I actually didn't mention the shack in there because honestly i didn't think about it and uh <laughs> There's so if, if I would have taken the time to go through all of the literature, all of the 
the rabbis or the pastors or all of the authors, then <laughs> I'd have had to write a book on that. But, you know, the shack is definitely one. As far as Rob Skiba goes, um, I don't follow Rob anymore. Um, I used to. I used to watch his stuff. I haven't heard him say anything Kabbalistic myself, but I know that he has Zen Garcia on his program all the time, and um, which may be why uh, the person in the chat asked about them together because uh, they are literally uh, on each other's uh, YouTube channels all the time. And, um, you know, I, I tell you what, when I first when my eyes first started opening to the truth and I, I guess I became a part of this truther movement. Um, Rob Skiba was somebody that I watched a lot. Um, yeah. and he, he had a lot of, of truth, you know, he really did. Uh, but he's actually one of the people that I was talking about when I said, I've watched people literally go off the deep end. Now, I stopped watching him um, probably a year ago uh, when I when I really started doing my program. It, it got to where I could only follow so many other people, and the ones that I were gonna follow, I I made sure that they were sound. Um, you know, I got I thank God for the Fourth Watch. Everybody uh, on the Fourth Watch Radio, um, because uh, you know I've been listening to to Justin and and you for. Uh, long time. Um, I was actually listening to Justin, uh, of course, before you came on the network. But um, yeah, man, I love you guys. I always have. And uh, uh, the Lord puts people together. I know that for a fact. That's the way that I I met Mary Callie, and um, you know she is family. Uh, you know, even though we are, of course, all family in the kingdom. You know, we're. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, she's she couldn't be closer to me if she was my blood. I love her to death. And um, which, you know, that's one thing I love about the Next Chapter Radio Network. We are a family. Uh, we really are. When I got in the accident, you know, they, they got in a car and drove to South Carolina from Baltimore, Maryland. Damn. And they, uh, you know, I, I love them. I really do. And um, they've, they've really shown me the love of Christ and uh, I thank the Lord for them. But this, uh, I believe that all of these things, John Hagee, I saw somebody ask about John Hagee. Um, <laughs> I've, um, I've seen him lift up a lot of these authors and, um, there, uh, Michael Brown. Michael Brown. He lifts up it. It's Jack Shapira and the the kosher pig all the time. He he uh, he really does. One of the the people that I wrote about in the book on a positive note um, is um, Kabbalah secrets Christians need to know. Um, the um, it's a look, it's, it's a, it's really an expose on the kosher pig, you know, um, it's, it's not a book, it's not a book about Kabbalah the way mine is, but it's got so many good facts in it, and especially where Kabbalah is concerned, um, and it points out all of the the teachings in um, the kosher pig, and it breaks them down. And all of the people, I mean, the teachings in the kosher pig are the Kabbalah. I mean, they really are. So when when she breaks down all of that stuff, like Sephirot tree and all of the different. Um, gods on the Sephirot tree uh it, it's it's really beneficial and it, it helped me a lot in the book that's why i put uh, a lot of it in it and i gave her credit and um you were talking about earlier how uh 
the the Jewish sparks, and that's that's a big thing in Kabbalah. They um, you there there was a a time when Kabbalah was only practiced and only allowed to be practiced by um, rabbis over 40 years old or not just rabbis but um, you know uh, people of the Jewish faith they had to be over 40 years old to be spiritually mature and um, well one of the reasons for that is um, one of the practices one of the big practices in Kabbalah is like I said they they try to invoke this vision um, that Ezekiel had and they have to get past all these angels through this mystical meditation that they do. They, they have to open these doors using the words, like you were talking about the, the Hebrew words. And, um, um, they they have to get past all these, um, angels to get into the throne room of God. And they believe they actually are in the throne room of God, but we know that the only way, to be able to boldly approach the throne of grace is through Jesus Christ. Amen. Not just meditation. But that is what they believe and that is what they do. The You were talking about um, how the name it and claim it, how um, the word of faith takes Kabbalah uh, the way that they believe Yahweh spoke the Hebrew words and the words themselves actually created the world and everything in it. Well, in Kabbalah and and, and in um, Messianic Judaism, they don't. The God of the Bible, um, Yahweh or Yehovah, however you want to pronounce it, that's not. They believe that their God is Ein Sof. The Ein Sof created Elohim. So, um, you know, they believe Elohim created the world and everything in it, but Ein Sof created Elohim. And um, there's that Ein Sof is uh, Well, Jeremy, you froze up if you can hear me. Um, hold on a moment. Let's see if that brings him back. All right. We got a blank screen for Mr. Anderson. All right. Hold on. Brother, I don't know what happened, but uh, I, hey, uh, we're, we're glad you're here. All right. For a minute. Um, <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but I, I'm back. Thank the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Um, so we were kind of... Uh, talking a little bit about this creation narrative, right? Let's move into some deep, deep teachings now that we've kind of set a baseline about what Kabbalah is and some of the dangerous practices that are coming into this. Um, when you start getting into this Jewish mysticism, right? Like, you start understanding that these people, nine times out of ten, historically veer away from the Trinity at some point. Right, absolutely. Which is, which is dangerous because they believe that God is now a manifestation. And that Father, Son, Holy Spirit are just manifestations of the same God through different people. So, what's dangerous about this, obviously, is in the New Apostolic Reformation... People are being taught that the final revelation of Jesus will come from the earth instead of the sky. It'll come through people, which is, and which will ultimately lead to one dude rising up with the full Christ consciousness or the full revelation of the manifestation of God. And that works if you don't believe in the Trinity because Jesus Christ was a manifestation of God 2,000 years ago, and whoever the Antichrist is, could be a manifestation of God or another manifestation of Jesus. Now, the other dangerous thing that we're looking at as this ties into Bible prophecy is this idea that you have to have these out-of-body experiences, right? 
that is something that unites all religions. You, you look at Sufism, which is a Muslim mystical practice. They do the whirling dervishes to put them in that altered state of consciousness. In the Jewish Kabbalah, you have to make your way into the throne room. Uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, man, we were, I was watching, a, what's that huckster's name? Uh, Sid Roth had on Patricia King. Her new book is how to access the throne room of God each and every single day. I teach you how to do that for 1999. Come with a free DVD. Um, and then you have like obviously the Jewish Kabbalah isms. You have, you have uh, the Hindu yoga that teaches you to go into that altered state of consciousness. Satan wants to take you out from the safety and the framework of this, and your right mind to turn off your mind so that he can access it. And to get you to start taking uh, out-of-body experiences, the new age is into this too, right? Obviously. So how does this mystical spirit journey stuff, how does this tie into uniting one world religions? How does Satan play on that in the end times and use it as a unifying force? to unite all religions under this Jewish Kabbalahism? Well, the big thing, and, you know, this, this is a big thing in Judaism itself, in, in rabbinic Judaism, is um, they say Messiah will not come until all of the sparks are gathered back to Ein Sof or, or to Israel. Um, and... The, the sparks, of course, are the Jewish people. Um, they believe that Messiah will not come until er, all of them are, are gathered back into Israel. Well, another big, big part of this is that you, we're all gods. We're little gods. Um, and, uh, you know, if you if you look at the Pope, who you know, in my opinion, could very easily be the second beast of Revelation. I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying that he would be a good candidate. Um, you know, he is embracing all religions pretty much. He's already trying to put them under one umbrella. And the way the way Kabbalah is open to literally every religion. You were talking about uh, the Muslims earlier. In Islam, you know, Kabbalah is entrenched in Islam. They a lot, they don't realize it, but doing my research for this book and over you know a period of you know three four years re researching the Kabbalah period, um, man. It is in a lot of religions. A lot of the rabbis believe in the the ascended masters, which of course comes, you know, it, it, that's in Hinduism. It's in the New Age movement. It's a Gnostic teaching. Um, the way you know Kabbalah makes it possible for all religions to be in one but also i believe for the the beast it's for for the first beast of revelation who i believe will be um considered the the messiah by the jewish people you know i think you have to be someone that they can accept as the messiah um i truly believe that uh Freemasonry will play a huge part in this because it is <laughs> literally in everything. You know, the, the Masons are in, in every part of society, in every level of society, all the way up through government, in the churches, in the synagogues, you know, <sighs> you know, in the mosque, it really goes outside of all 
religious boundaries and yet it is a religion you know they they say well we're not a religion we're just religious but that's just double speak you know um that's just that's just serpent speak and to me i believe that that will be the way that you know i don't know exactly how it'll come about you know a lot of people have different theories um because of how the the roman catholics and the pope are so interested in um space and they have the lucifer device a lot of people believe that uh the beast or the messiah will come as a as an alien savior um a lot of people believe it'll have a lot to do with um transhumanism and um artificial intelligence um me myself i believe it'll be kabbalistic uh, and kabbalistic it'll be a kabbalistic sorcerer and probably a, a strong political leader that um wouldn't be I, I don't know if he would be considered a rabbi but it would have to be somebody who could bring everybody together um that all fates would accept and really the Kabbalah is the most accepted by by all of the fates and and masonry like I said plays the biggest part in it um if you really dig into Freemasonry uh it connects all of the fates um it's got tentacles literally going out into every faith every uh political branch all the way uh down to your police forces uh, i mean you're not gonna find a group of people that doesn't have the masons in it and the masons are kabbalistic but um you know i think that that kabbalistic sorcery will play a huge role in the lying signs and wonders and, um, you know, like the, the chapter on the goal. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. But before we do, let's, since we're throwing out uh, theories, I'm going to run a theory by you, and you can either give it a thumbs up, thumbs down, or be like, that's a cool theory, but no. <laughs> so what happens if, because uh, I'm with you 100%, that we sometimes try to make the Bible fit science fiction more than we do um, the Near Eastern ancient worldview. Okay. So, like, the Bible is a deeply Hebraic book, which means that if prophecy is going to be fulfilled, man, like, it's going to be fulfilled in a very Hebraic way. Because Satan, you know, the question I sometimes get is, why is Satan using Jewish terminology? Why is he masquerading as a Metatron? Why is he masquerading and cloaking himself in, in the Hebrew language? Why is he doing things that Yahweh has carved out on his own? Well, because Satan is an imitator. And right. I think to a large extent, like if I was a prideful dude like Satan, I'd not only want people to bow down and worship me, I'd want people to go against my greatest enemy and worship me in my greatest enemy's name using my greatest enemy's own words and works and religion against him. It would be like an extra added kick in the junk. Can we say that? We'll say that. We'll say it. I, I don't mean to be too crude here. But what if this Kabbalism is the thing that unites all religion? There's a bit of it in everything. And an alien overlord or an alien species which we would call alien, right? Mm -hmm. But the aliens, if you read Hovana Blavatsky, Aleister Crowley, things like that, they're not really aliens. That's just our backwards view on them. They are actually ascended masters, heavenly beings. And these heavenly beings descend upon the earth. And we, if you follow Gary Wayne, these cherubs and things are very serpentine, just like the divine serpenter, Ein Sof. What if this alien, quote-unquote alien invasion, doesn't necessarily look like flying saucers, but looks incredibly a lot like 
uh, chariots of fire and fallen angels coming down out of the sky. And what if the main angel says, I'm Ein Sof. I gave humanity the key and the gematria to unlock all of humanity's power and to evolve them into a place that I am physically at. I created Yahweh. Yahweh went rogue and tried to narrowly define what this teaching was. Jesus also did this. Or someone that could call themselves Jesus pops up and says, you guys perverted my message and claimed it was more narrow than it was supposed to be. I was teaching Kabbalah Jewish mysticism. I was healing by Kabbalah Jewish mysticism in my words. I am the word of God. I am the Metatron. Like, the whole world, and he's like, and you Muslims, Ein Sof is like, you Muslims, look at the Kabbalahistic teachings I gave humanity in your religion. Islam, uh, Indians, look at this. Like, New Angers, look at this. Look at how you all have a piece of the puzzle. Let's put them all together. Let's put them all together. We can agree that y'all need to take spirit trips. We can agree that you need to soak. We can agree that when you pray for people, it's kundalini yoga. We can agree that the music that you're listening to is all there. This is so dangerous because we literally see the dragon, which is a serpent, Absolutely. right? Sarah. We see him as the head of this trinity. We see the beast and the false prophet, this new world order, come together as a beast system, which is a, a small trinity in and of itself. It's the image of the beast the actual beast, and the second beast, the false prophet, they're in this picture, and then there's a woman riding the scarlet beast who everybody forgets about, right? But she's one of the end times players, this female, Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary Barbella thing. Yeah, it's interesting that when the Bible describes the end times deception, right, they put her in that picture. It's God and goddess worship which is different than what God is. They make the virgin bride of Christ into a harlot. And we see that going on with the, the feminization of Christianity. You know, like the, and I'm sorry, I say it, people get upset, but there's a reason that most pastors and worship leaders look like they're queer, even if they're not. They're afraid to have beards. They're afraid not to have the product in their hair. They have to wear the uniform and the skinny jeans and look like they were recently ambushed by Queer Eye for the, for the straight guy. They're singing about a mother's love and not a father's love in most of these churches because the father will love you, but he'll also judge and correct you, but the mother will just wrap you up and make you feel loved. And this mother harlot's coming from this Kabbalah system, and it's going to be... The deception is going to be so, so, so devastating because it's going to look Hebraic. So it's going to look Christian. And it's also Bible, going to look Muslim. All, that if, it were, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. So we know it's going to be very... <laughs> well, they're going to be doing power miracles based on the Hebraic words of God. Absolutely. And the mark of the beast could very well be the Tav and tie into the Golem. And people are like, well, I won't take a microchip, but I'll put a cross on my head. I'll weep for Tammuz. There you go. <laughs> like, if you read, oh, man, I want to do so bad a series on that Temple Vision by Jeremiah because it lays it out. Like, his seeing that vision of the things that were in the temple, you could literally say, this is a vision for the end times and the things that are going on in the third abomination temple. Yeah. Down to the very people who have, that are weeping for Tammuz, that literally means they're marking themselves for Tammuz. And all you have to do is Google what the mark of Tammuz is and it's cross. It's 100% a cross. It's the same thing on the golem's head. Um, man. Let's talk about the Gollum, dude. I'm excited about this. I wanted to talk about this because very few people hold to the, to the position that the image of the beast is some sort of Gollum. They think it's just strictly AI alone. 
what did your research tune, uh, tune, uh, bleh, turn up on this? Because I know there's a chapter in the book. Yeah, chapter five is actually about the golem. But, um, you know, the golem story, uh, I think, just like me and you talked about, will or, or definitely could possibly be the image of the beast um, from the book of Revelation, you know. Uh, Revelation says that all who dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names aren't written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And, you know, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And verse 15 says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So so he's a little bit more than a computer programmer, is what you're trying to say. Absolutely. He's actually what, Call, I mean, it, it it lays it out in the scripture. It says, um, you know, it, he can speak. Um, he's alive. And he also, it's the image of the beast that causes everyone that doesn't worship the beast to be killed. Um, and, you know, of course, the Gollum story is, it actually, it's, it's a mystical creature that comes from, Jewish folklore, but, um, you know, we, I use the term folklore loosely. Um, it's an animated, uh, anthropomorphic being that is created entirely from inanimate matter, uh, clay, uh, like, like God created Adam, uh, um, from the clay of the earth and, uh, you know, it, it's it comes from medieval writings, but the most famous Gollum narrative involves uh, Rabbi um, Judah Lowell, and he's a he was a late 16th century rabbi from Prague, and it was believed that he actually brought a Gollum to life. And, yeah, we're uh, looking at your what you're describing for people that are at home watching. Is this book called Gollum Stories and Pictures by David Wininski? You can get it on Amazon Kindle. You, I have a hard copy of it, and I also have it on Kindle, so I'm showing it on the Kindle. This is an award-winning uh, illustrated book that breaks down the story of the Gollum, and it's exactly what you're saying. Um, and it shows its Kabbalistic nature, man. So... Before we go any further, let's just read the back of this book. And then you can share the story of the Gollum. And we can uh, really do a deep dive on this. So if you read this book, um, and you go to the back cover of the book, you'll see something called a note. And it gives the whole... uh, backstory of the golem but the interesting part of this is that rabbi low brought this golem to life based on the kabbalah it says the shift makes sense if one considers both low's reputation as a kabbalist and the occult atmosphere of prague during low's time the city was filled with alchemists and necromancers many on the payroll of Emperor Rudolf II. Fascinated by the supernatural ambiance, the emperor had moved his residence from Vienna to Prague. He actually met with Rabbi Lowe on February 23rd, 1592, possibly to discuss political matters of the virtues of astrology. Legend has that the encounter was a showdown over the fate of the Gollum. The story of the Gollum serves as a cautionary tale about the limits of human power it has inspired the works of composers 
and authors. There's evidence of its influence in Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein. The tale may even prove prophetic in the fields of computer science, robotics, gene manipulation. Advanced technological golems may arise in our culture. This is an atheist, uh, a secular Jew that's writing this, by the way. And if you look at, like, uh, the very last sentiment in this book, before the book closes, it says, Since then the golem has slept dreamless sleep of clay, but many say he could awaken. Perhaps when the desperate need for justice is united with holy purpose, the golem will come forth again. You know, that sounds... Uh prophetic it really does um you know I, and i don't mean prophetic in the way that uh god gives prophecy to you know prophets in in the bible i just mean you know that it almost sounds like uh you know they know the same thing that 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 we know <laughs> or that we're we're talking about um and of course i I believe wholeheartedly that the enemy and the uh, evil spiritual forces, they know what they're going to do. It's their game plan. You know, they, they're, they're writing this playbook. Um, the golem, uh, Rabbi Lowell was the one who actually supposed, well, you know, I, I'm not going to say supposedly. I believe he brought this thing to life. Um, I do too. Yeah. And, uh, it, it really does come from Kabbalah, you know, and, and the power to do this exists. I, I truly believe that. And um, it, it, there's a story in the Talmud. It's about this group of rabbis, you know, they're, they're on this journey. And uh, as they, they go, they, they become hungry. And it says that, that they actually created a calf out of clay. And they they cooked and, and ate the calf, um, and they also you know they had the the power to create life. And um, the, the this is a they they the rabbis believed that that this group of rabbis in the the Talmud. And so this is for anybody who says that the Talmud is not connected to the Kabbalah. These rabbis, and, and um, when I say these rabbis, I mean uh, the rabbis of that period, but also now, they believe that the way that the rabbis in the Talmud were able to bring this calf to life was using Kabbalistic sor sorcery, or uh, actually it says Kabbalistic rituals, but we know that that's sorcery yeah. from the Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation. Um and uh, that is the same ritual, in, in my opinion, that the false prophet, the second beast of Revelation, is going to use or very well could use to bring this image of the beast to life. Um, you know, you were talking a few minutes ago about how uh, Satan is a great imitator. Uh, he, he wants to imitate everything that God does. Well, also, you know, we see in the Old Testament that the gods of the Gentile nations, they, you know, people a lot of times mistakenly believe that, that these people just worshipped wood and stone. But right. the idols were actually um, just statues that represented the gods that they worship. It was no different than the, the golden calf representing Yahweh. Um, the Israelites creating the, the image of the calf to represent Yahweh. Uh, it's the same with the, the Gentile uh, idols, but they had, they had a ritual. And, um, you know, I truly believe that this is where the, the mystics, the, the Jewish sages, got the idea and got the, the rituals for uh, bringing things to life and giving life to images in the Sefer Yetzirah. See, that, 
The Sefer Yetzirah is actually, it actually means the book of creation. Um, and in the Sefer Yetzirah is where it talks about, um, you know, God using the Hebrew letters, the actual letters to create things. Um, like, and- like the Gollum. Like this clay golem, it was a mal, it was Ahmed Amatha that he put on there. And when he erased it, certain things, it was the the cross. Like, it's crazy that, you know, like the Bible says that this Antichrist is going to claim to be God, the false prophets. I mean, like, it's this, like, what else could you not do to prove that you're God, right? Like anyone can make a computer, anyone can make an avatar, anyone can make a robot and teach it to to speak and live. But to open up the book of the Bible to Genesis and say, look, I'm creating something out of clay or dust, just like God did to Adam, and I'm going to make it come alive. Now you're claiming to wield the power of God. Now, I don't think that that thing will be able to take on flesh like God created, like when man became more than just a clay monster, right? Adam became a full being with, you know, he was inhabited by, God put his own spirit in there. Like, I believe that when these Kabbalists do these things, evil demonic entities enter into these clay things and animate them. That, that's that's exactly how it was done in the Old Testament. These, um, you know, I, it goes back to the worship of the Nephilim. They were worshiped when they were alive. When they died, when when God sent the flood, it killed them. Their spirits became the evil spirits or demons, and you know they were still worshipped. And they entered into these uh, the images of the idols or the images of these gods. And it's the same with the golem. Uh, you know, when when it when it's created, they're not actually given it life. They're just creating a shell and then um these entities you know will inhabit it and of course you know we in this day and age this technological age where it's almost impossible to fool people and and, well (laughs) people are gullible but you know what i mean like we've seen so much scientific wise it's it's really going to have to be actual, you know, magical uh, things like you read in books or see on TV for people to be fooled into believing that this is God and worship the beast. And um, that, that's why I don't believe that the AI could could be it, you know, or or transhumanism. Now, what you were talking about earlier with the, the alien savior, which would really be a fallen angel, you know, I was right with you on that. You know, I I think that could so easily be um, exactly what happens. And you know, the Revelation says that um, Satan actually enters into the beast. Um, yeah. And I believe that that will actually happen. Um, And then, you know, I still, I hold, (laughs) I hold the Pope as the highest candidate for the false prophet Um, because, you know, even before we had this Pope, by non-believers and Catholics and even some who claim to be followers of Christ, they all consider the Pope to be the spiritual leader of the world, right? Um, yeah. the, the representation of God on earth, even though he he's the representation of the God of this earth. Um, you know, he, he he's, represents the prince of the power of the air, not the king of kings and the creator of the universe. But, you know, that's that's what is believed by so many who are deceived. Um, you know, we have truly got blind watchmen in church. And that is, and, you know, to me, that's why so many people are going to fall away, man. I, and it really grieves me in my spirit when I think about it. Um, 
I think about people sitting in church pews um, who really believe that that they're saved because they said some magic words and they come to church on Sundays and then they live like the world the rest of the week or even some who may believe that they're saved and try to live it out, but they, they don't have that relationship and they don't truly have Christ in their heart. So when this, and they, and also they believe they're going to be taken out of here. So, uh, you know, they're going to be wondering what in the world's going on. Um, why am I still here? And then, I believe you hit the nail on the head when this thing comes and says, you know, I am Christ. I am Jesus. Y'all are corrupting um, my my word. That's not what it really says or what it really means. You know, this is what I meant. Um, I am God. Worship me. And, you know, I believe there will be so many who will fall away, take the mark and, you know, regardless to what John MacArthur says, when you take the mark of the beast, that's it. There's no turning back. And that's why we have to start talking about these things because there are bigger issues that we need to face. Like right now there's a fight in the chat going on over about Christmas trees and Yule logs and about stuff like that. And Andrew, if this dude's getting contentious, you're a mod. You can kick him. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead and do that, man. Like, if that's your depth of your knowledge, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Because whether it's right or not to celebrate Christmas is about this much of the argument. I mean, imagine what's going to happen when... The, the the Temple Institute is given the okay to build this temple. And let's lay this out. Like, they're given the okay to build this temple. This temple's an abomination to God. It's not the good, correct temple. To Freemasons, sacred geometry in Solomon's temple and the keys of Solomon and all that stuff— if you don't think that the third temple is going to be completely a Masonic temple full of sacred geometry built by Masons, oversaw by the Pope and whoever this Jewish Antichrist is, you're nuts. It's going to be. And all these people that are in Christianity that are in the Hebrew Roots movement that are like, I would never put a Christmas tree up in my house. I would never light a Yule log are like buying temple coins with President Trump's image on it. So they can support the third temple going up because that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And And then it's really go ahead. People don't realize that even though they they really don't they don't realize it. And you know, Hebrew roots people they they bash dispensationalists. They are they 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 have so much in common that it's it's crazy. They are really cousins. especially as far as what you were saying about buying the temple coins. Um, you know, they both are about all things Hebrew, uh, this, this special secret Hebrew knowledge. Yeah. But, you know, and, far- and what's, what's going to happen when the Pope and leads that contingent of people up on that, that Holy Mount into their Kabbalistic funded, uh, temple that believes in the Noahide laws, because like, the guy who's the head of the Temple Institute has teachings out there where he's like, yeah, we're going to conquer in the name of the Noahide laws. And if you raise the white flag of surrender, that's cool. But if you hang on to the name of Jesus, we're going to be edgy. Like they go into this temple and they're trying to like recreate these Jewish, uh, you know, setups. Like they have the red heifers. They had have everything. But the one thing they can't think of is in the original temples that were built, God himself lit the temple fire. And then the men, the high priests, were commanded to keep that fire burning. If that fire ever went out and you added your own fire, that was strange fire. God struck you down and killed you. How are you going to, how, 
in order for the whole beginning of the temple sacrifices to kick off so that the Antichrist can end them three and a half years into the tribulation, right? Like, in order for that to happen, fire has to come down from heaven and ignite that original offering in that temple, right? But we know that's not God that's going to light it. But we know that the false prophet, the one miracle that he's called out specifically for is calling fire down from heaven. And when he threw, and I believe it'll be the Pope, I believe that when whoever this last false pop prophet Pope is uh, will use Kabbalistic means to call that fire down from heaven, to consume that altar, and to start the fire on the altar that they're going to have to keep going, it'll be an abomination, strange fire. But what's the world going to do? What are the Hebrew rooters going to do when they see this happen and they think this is Elijah? What's the world going to do when they point to this as a biblical miracle and it can't be faked yeah, you know, as a special gonna... effect? Like, everybody's faith is going to get rocked. Absolutely, because we know the witnesses are going to call fire down from heaven as well. Oh, that's, that's, and they're going to be able to shut the heavens, you know, stop the rain. Um, there are going to be many deceived it's only the elect are going to be able to discern the the true power of God, the only creator, from the false power of Ein Sof. Yeah. And then they start using crosses and they start bringing golems to life. And, you know, the thing is, is if you read the the story of the golem and things like that, or if you, there's a, there's a group called the Lamed Hay. There's, there's supposed to be like, I think, 12 rabbis in Israel that are an underground Kabbalistic group. And it's a life to death sort of thing. Once you're in, you're in until you die. And when you die, they have to add a new rabbi who's, who has power in the Kabbalah. And the initiation rite happens when you make a clay golem, a little golem doll. And you perform the golem ceremony and you put the, the, you baptize this thing into a pool of like green uh, bubble things come up out of it. You take the thing out, you write the ominous tav on its forehead and it comes to life and it breathes. And then you quickly erase it so it has to die. But there's a group that's actually out there that does this sort of stuff, right? But if you look at the process of what's happening in the Bible, while well, all this stuff is going on, you know that the Antichrist has a deadly wound in his head that's healed. He comes back to life. He's resurrected. And here's the crazy thing. If you look at the New Apostolic Reformation, if you look at the teachings of William Branham, if you look at these guys, if you look at what Todd White teaches, what Bill Johnson teaches, Jesus was just a man who kept the word of God and the Jewish law of God, and he kept it so blamelessly that when he was baptized, he became the Messiah and the anointed one. It was at his baptism, and then it was at his resurrection that he fully became God. Yeah. That's the narrative that, if you read the false prophet and the Antichrist narrative, that's exactly what this is. Some guy in the future, some Jewish guy is going to be baptized by these Kabbalistic groups. They're going to be given, he's going to be endued with special power. The Bible says that he's going to die. The Jewish traditions, the Jewish teachings themselves teach that as the son of Joseph, he's going to die on a battlefield defending Israel from its enemies. They're going to bring him back in. He's going to be resurrected as the son of David. And I would guarantee you that they're going to resurrect him by the same means that they resurrect the golem, which is that tab on the forehead. And it's right there. And then they're going to, yeah. And people are going to be like, oh my goodness, we just saw biblical miracles. The Christians lied to us. And then the Hebrew roots are going to be like, yeah, we were right. And then they're going to turn around and say, hey, all these plagues and all these natural disasters that are falling from the heaven like, if you want to be protected from not dying, take the same mark that he took that yeah, raised him from the dead. We are the elect. This is the, the Yeah, you take the same mark that, that raised the, the, the clay golem. And then 
you're possessed by demons and you have entrance into the new world order and all the technology and stuff you're able to get upgraded and then people seek they seek death but can't find it man and that's real i believe that goes back to um you know the same reason uh god sent the flood and i talk about that in the book how um all flesh became corrupt and yes of course people were sinful and all of their thoughts were evil continuously but their flesh, their DNA was also corrupt. They yeah. were, I believe that they were no longer man. They were no longer God's, what God created. And I think that exact same thing will happen when you take the mark. Regardless to what it is, it's going to change your DNA and make it to where you're no longer God's creation. You're no longer human. Um, and then you're damned. Uh, and there's no turning back. And, you know, people get too wrapped up on things like the holidays. You know, I, anybody who watches my program or has followed me knows that me personally, I, I don't celebrate the pagan holidays. And I, I believe that their, their roots are pagan, but I don't harp on that. And I definitely don't, um, I don't condemn people who do, you know, I, um, <laughs> I definitely don't take it into um, the Hebrew Hebrew roots side of it. I don't uh, I don't go crazy with it. Um, you know, I love absolutely love the biblical feast. I love the way they they uh, foreshadow and and show Jesus coming, show the Messiah coming. Um, you know, I love to to study them and. Uh, you know, my wife and my kids and I have have even taken part in them. And I believe that they will also foreshadow Jesus's return. You know, just like we can we can look and I um, see when he was born um, through the feast. I think we'll be able to see his return. Of course, not the exact time, but right. the season. The season um and you know anybody who gets hung up on that um it really does show uh the depth of your wisdom you know you can have plenty of knowledge and not have wisdom right wisdom is about fighting the battles that matter um and this thing the the biggest thing a believer needs is to be humble you need to be humble so that you can have the love of Christ because humbleness and the love of Christ go hand in hand. Uh, it, you're not, you're not going to have the love of Christ in you if you're not humble. And, you know, we have to die to ourselves daily. Amen. We're going to move into the final part of this discussion because this is a cool point and the stuff that you said lead into it. We've been talking about the Kabbalah. We've been talking about the battles we must fight in these end times. When we talk about the Kabbalah, we're talking about a system of belief. It's a spirit of mysticism. It's a spiritual worldview that cuts across all religions. It's a, it's a system that was perverted by Satan. And if there's a pervert in a convert or a, a counterfeit, then it's obviously that the true workings and the power of the Holy Spirit is the answer. And in these end times, when all of these things come to pass, and atheism is dead, because everyone's going to believe in some sort of ascended being or God, whether that's Satan as the angel of light, or if that's Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. There's going to be two worldviews and two spiritual powers fighting each other. And that's going to be a lot of the conflict. And I'm just going to put it this way. Your book talks a lot about uh, Aleister Crowley. It talks about how he, he influenced the Kabbalah and his spell workings and his rituals and his magic. And you got to give it up to Aleister Crowley in a certain certain sort of way if you think about it, because not only did this dude um, practice deep, deep ritual magic 
not only is he idolized by every occultist that you know basically is worth a grain of salt, but he's idolized by culture too. The Beatles, the Eagles, uh, just throughout culture. If you look at a lot of stuff that's going on in culture, this idea that Marilyn Manson, you know, he's influenced by him. David Bowie was influenced by him. He influenced culture. He influenced governors, uh, entertainers. Oh, like yeah. this idea, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law, this humanistic idea. You don't even have to be a, a Crowley follower to believe it. Like they, anytime you have this thing that you can do whatever you want and be true to your authentic self, Crowleyism. But what Crowley did, the reason Crowley was so powerful is because this dude would spend even up to a year performing a ritual. Huh? A year, a year performing a ritual. To him, spending a month in, in prayer and fasting and satanic power was nothing to this guy. He literally sold out his whole life to go as far as he could to swim as deep as he could in the streams of the devil. And was proud of it. And was proud of it and, and changed the world, turned the world upside down. One man, hand in hand with the devil. On the other side of Christianity, if you read the book of Acts, one of the charges leveled against them was, here come those who have turned the world upside down. <laughs> they moved in the power of the Holy Spirit also. They didn't need to perform rituals for a year because every single day of the year, they followed Jesus hardcore and moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. They prayed, they fasted. They were willing to do the things that Crowley was willing to do. Crowley was willing to pay a price for the spiritual power and authority that he walked in. And if we don't get it in 15 minutes and a, and a five minute a day reading plan for a year, then we just write that crap off. Right. I'm telling you, man, if we had half, no, if we had 10% of the dedication to Jesus and the Holy Spirit that Crowley had to the devil, we would turn this world upside down, but we don't. We're busy playing games with God while they're playing God That's and right. tapping into occult power. But we're afraid of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're afraid of tongues. We're afraid of healing. We're afraid of laying on of hands. We're afraid of casting out devils. We're afraid of prophesying. We're afraid of all the gifts of the Spirit because the bad guys have given it such a black eye, and now we're afraid to be associated with anything that the Bible approves of. You have to walk in the power and the supernatural authority of Christ in these end times. I did that show yesterday. People, I got emails, man, and I knew I would. But they were like, "Man, one. well, you, you, you need the guns. So you, like, you people come looking for your cans of food, man. You better have guns. Just inviting people in for a meal is stupid." And I'm like, "Look, dude, I got something more powerful than a shotgun on my side. Like, if a dude in the flesh comes into my house and is looking for food, I can feed him." But if a dude comes onto my property full of the devil and murder and bad intentions, he's going to get an earful of the gospel. That's the first gauge in my shotgun. The second gauge of my shotgun is called exorcism, and I will cast that devil out. I've done that before. I know how to cast out devils. I know how to walk in the authority of Christ. I know how to stop a person dead in their tracks that come against you in the name of Jesus. I did that in ministry as an evangelist, as an Assembly of God minister. I've seen that thing. I've walked in that thing. That's what you're going to need. That's the spiritual force and power you're going to need in these end times to protect yourself. The Bible is very clear. It's the kingdom of God, man. It's holding on to the kingdom of God. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if, if I cast out the devils, then you know the finger of the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's one of the reasons we know it's that power and that authority. And how dare we take a five-minute course on the Holy Spirit? How dare we think that we can go up in front of the church altar and have some dude lay hands on us and start speaking some sort of gibberish 
And then we start speaking the gibberish because we hear him speaking the gibberish and we claim that that's the Holy Ghost. And we're like, forget all this, what the Bible says. Jesus says, tarry until you receive the power, meaning wait, sit down and wait, wait till the Holy Ghost comes on you. We've lost the discipline to wait. We've lost the discipline to fast. We've lost the discipline to walk boldly in the power of God. And we've taken matters into our own means. We'd rather have a gun than the power of exorcism, if we're completely honest, because the power to exercise people scares the daylights out of us, but it's easy to load a 12-gauge. And I'm not ripping on you if you have a gun for hunting or ripping on you if you own a gun. That's not the issue. It's the issue of where do we place our trust in an hour that's going to become increasingly supernatural. Guns are not supernatural. They make you feel safe to a certain extent, but when supernatural forces come at you, man, you better be able to fight back on your knees and through supernatural means. And the church needs to rediscover. They need to rediscover the power of Pentecost. They need to rediscover the power of the kingdom of God. And they need to rediscover the spiritual worldview of the Holy Ghost. Now I'm off my soapbox. Brother, brother, brother Jeremy, you close the show out however you want, my friend. I have to agree with you 100%. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> again, anybody who knows me knows that I, I, uh, I, I have plenty of guns, um, but I, I live on a farm and I love to hunt. But um, I, uh, I, have, I have kids, I have a family, and I've always had guns. Um, I've had my house broken into before. I never shot anybody, but I've had the guns. At the same time, what you just said resonated with me so much. As I was writing this book, this, these supernatural spiritual forces literally came against me and my family. Um, my wife would, was being attacked in her sleep. Um, almost on a nightly basis. Uh, she would have the worst nightmares of things that I can't even say on this program happening to her. And in the dreams, it was these, these demons. Um, you know, she, it, 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 were, it was not men doing these things to her. It, it was demons. And I was right there I could feel the evil presence in my bedroom and my gun was useless. I mean, what was I going to do? This is, and I, I thank God. I actually, I, I thank the Lord that this happened because it showed my youngest son at seven years old, the power, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And he, he came with me. I, I made him come with me. I laid hands on my wife and I started praying. And I made him do the same thing. He put his hands on my hands and I put my hand on one of my hands on his head and one of my hands on my wife. And oh my goodness, you could just see, you could see her as she relaxed. And um, she woke up a little while later and uh, described the dream to me. And she told me um, that it just all of a sudden stopped, that everything that was happening to her in the dream just stopped. And it wasn't me. It wasn't because I did anything. It was the Holy Spirit, and it was because I, I prayed and had faith in the authority that Jesus Christ has given to us. He gave us the authority over serpents and scorpions, over all the forces of the enemy. And, uh, you know, you, you were exactly right in, in Acts and, you know, talking about Crowley, the, the apostles in Acts, they had so much power. You know, Simon the sorcerer, he wanted to buy it from them. Um, you know, that's power that couldn't even be bought and definitely can't be matched by the enemy's power. 
Um, you know, I'm sure that it's very alluring. I, I have met Satanists and uh, witches and warlocks in my life, and they have true power. You know, I experienced their power at a very young age. Uh, my, my mom won uh, a lady to the Lord that was in a, a, a very dark left-handed path witch coven and uh they came against I, my family you know they they were putting uh, death curses and all kind of things on us and this was on halloween you know their their night their powerful night and um there's more to that story than i got time to tell right now but at the end of it all the the leader of the coven told my mom that no matter what they tried, everything they tried could not penetrate. Their, their killing spells that had killed plenty of people before could not get through. And it was because of the huge supernatural Holy Spirit power of a little 120-pound woman praying all night long against the enemy, binding those forces to where they could not penetrate, walking in that power, walking in that authority, having the faith to believe in it. And, you know, I saw that at a young age and it made a huge impression on me. You know, that no matter what I've done in my life, how far I strayed away from the Father before I came back to Christ and I surrendered my life, completely to him that always stuck with me and resonated with me and I always remembered it and um, anytime I come up against the the forces of darkness that's always the first thing that pops in my mind I know that I have the authority especially now that I'm um, you know versed in in the word and I, I know what the bible says and we have to <laughs> We have to have the exact same, if not a lot more, belief in the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, as the people who believe in the Kabbalah or uh, witchcraft or any of these powers of Satan. They believe they have a supernatural belief. Their supernatural worldview is a lot stronger than the believers. You know, we as a whole have lost the belief in the supernatural. You know, the, the, the view of cessationism has taken root in most of the church, even, even those who claim to believe in the gifts of the spirit and, and, and the power over darkness and the authority we have. You know, they don't walk in it. It's lip service. And we have to walk in it. That is the most important thing. And we have to do it daily. You know, I used to falsely believe, and I did this, um, that you woke up every morning and you put on your armor by praying and just saying the words right. from the Bible. And I wondered why I wasn't protected. You put on your armor by living out the things that are in the scripture. You have to walk in that. That is your armor. That is how you're protected. And you have to believe in the authority that Jesus Christ has given us as his body. The representative of Christ on this earth is not an old Kabbalist sitting in Rome, it is all of us, the body of Christ, the true believers, the remnant. And, you know, that is the true reason why I wrote the book is two reasons. One, believers, you know, the God really, I tried to write a, a book on the, the occult as a whole. You know, I was just going to write one book on the occult. And every time I'd start, the Lord would block it, you know, from every direction. And so I, I started praying 
and um, seeking his will. And he literally led me to what I was supposed to write about. And the fact that I had been researching it heavily for almost three years was just like, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, And I was able to see, you know, why I was led and all the directions I was led for the past three years. And people need to be able to recognize these things so they don't get caught up in. That's number one. That's reason number one. Reason number two is because a lot of people have accused me of being anti-Semitic, um, anti-Jewish, you know, not not loving my, my brethren. But our brethren, my brethren, is every Jew, Gentile, Greek, black, white, red, my friends, my enemies. That is my brothers, and that goes for the Jewish people. I have, I love the Jewish people, but I hate the religion of rabbinic Judaism. And the reason I hate it is because the Father hates it. And it's the practice that I hate. You know, we're, we're to uh, hate the sin and love the sinner. So I won't, I really hope, you know, at the, at the very end of the book, I, um, I wrote a, a true story of a Jewish man. He, he was ethnically Jewish and he was a Kabbalistic Jew. He was raised in rabbinic Judaism in the 70s who came to Christ. And he didn't come to Christ as the, the Messianic Yeshua that is Metatron. He came to a real relationship with the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Um, you know, that is the second goal that I want and that I believe the reason God led me to write this book is to reach people, the, the Jewish people. Um, and, and, you know, there are plenty of people who practice Kabbalah and have converted to Judaism who are not ethnically Jewish. So when I say Jewish people, I'm not talking just about ethnic Jews. I'm talking about people who have converted to Judaism and who are going to Messianic congregations and taking part in these practices. Also people who are going to these NRA churches and who idolize people like Bob Jones and you know think he's a prophet. I, the Lord has really given me a heart for people and a love for people. And I, I, I want to reach people and I want to help people and give the body of Christ the tools they need. And, you know, that that's the main reason for the book. And the occult is real. The powers of the occult and the powers of the enemy are real. We need to be able to see them, recognize them because they're going to come against us. Yeah. And, you know, not believing in something doesn't protect you from it. Right. If anything, it makes you more vulnerable to it. Yeah. And, you know, the second book, um, I've already started working on it. It's on Gnosticism. Uh, book two is on Gnosticism, uh, which follows very closely with the Kabbalah. And, uh, you know, it, it deals greatly with the Ascended Masters and the magic and the, the rituals in theosophy and, uh, you know, that side of things, which really they, they both stemmed from the same root, the, the same practices, you know, they came out of, uh, really first and second century, uh, Ju Judaism. And, you know, I just really, Pray that people will see what's going on and come to Christ before it's too late, BDK, because um, time is running out. It is. We're going to close with this.
whenever we do shows about the Kabbalah or about witchcraft or about Satanism or about the new age or even the new apostolic reformation, man, we will always more often than not draw at least four to five people who come who are either practicing Kabbalah, practicing witchcraft, practicing the new apostolic reformation, practicing Satanism, because they're drawn to the YouTube art or however God draws them to this place. And I want to take a moment to speak directly to anyone that's practicing Kabbalah or witchcraft right now that's watching this. And you've made it all the way to the end, and that's God's Holy Spirit keeping you in place. You might say, BDK, Jeremy, uh, we agree with you that the Christian church doesn't walk in the power of God. It's one of the reasons we practice Kabbalah, because we tried Christianity, and it left a sour taste in our mouth, and there was no power there. We went to the Kabbalah, but you don't understand, BDK. Like, I have spells that can heal people. I've, I've, I've spell prayed and spoke things, and people have been legitimately healed. I've cursed people that have come against me. You talk about the Holy Spirit to protect my family. People have come against my family, and I've used the power of the Kabbalah or witchcraft to curse these people, and they've died. When I pray, I get results. I can write them down. I can show you newspaper clippings of the power that's on our side that doesn't exist in the church. Where's your God? Where's your Mount? You talked about calling down fire from heaven. Where's your Mount Carmel experience? Where's your Elijah? I'm going to tell you something. It may be 100% true that you can do all those miracles. And you may be able to open up these angelic doors through your out-of-body experiences. You may be able to say the sentences just right and heal and bring curses and bring life and attract things. And you may be able to do that all on this side of the world, but there's going to come a day, like Jeremy just said, where you're going to have to stand before what you think is God. That's right. And you're going to be shocked at who you're standing in front of. And in that moment, these angelic beings that you've opened up these doorways to, that you've communed with, that you've used all your spell casting powers, you're going to see them in a different light too. And you're going to look and these angels of light are going to be very fallen, very evil. And instead of you opening doors, they're going to put chains on you. And they're going to drag you towards a door on the left side called hell. And in that moment, there's only going to be one sentence that saves. And you're not going to find it in the Kabbalah. That sentence is, I was bought with a price by the blood of Jesus, you lead. You see, everything comes down to that moment. That unless you can truly say that you are saved and that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior and that he has covered you in his blood and you are born again and you are made new, it doesn't matter what you do on this side of the world because all of those evil demons that you worship that give you all this earthly power will tie you in chains and drag you to hell unless you have the power of Jesus Christ in that moment unless you can stand on the side of the atonement. You need to think about your life because the power that we have is a power that's not of this world. Whether we see a miracle or don't see a miracle, it doesn't matter. It matters is what you're going to do when you stand before Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and as the Father. But Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand. Either Jesus will stand up and speak for you in that moment and plead your case, and you will be able to call on the name of Jesus 
because you have already called on him, he saved you, and you're able to affirm what Jesus is saying? Or those very same spirits that promised you all this power that healed and cursed will betray you in that moment and drag you to hell? The choice is yours. Please make that choice wisely. And that applies to anyone, even if you're not practicing the Kabbalah. Get right with God. This is no longer the time to play around with your salvation. The world ends for every person, regardless of whether Jesus returns or not. People die. By the time I just said that, someone just died. Absolutely. Someone's world just ended, whether Jesus returned or not. Give your life to Jesus. He is the only way to the Father. Thank you, Jeremy, for coming on the show tonight. I can't believe we haven't done shows together before. Um, I definitely going to have you on again at some point because you're an awesome brother. Um, we'll talk more about this. Uh, he wrote a book. It's out today. Um, shameless plugging. Yeah, I I plug the things that I believe in. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, like I don't invite many people on unless I believe in them personally and their work. You know that I don't use my show to shell things, and that, dude, I get requests from authors every single day that want to be a part of this podcast. Can I send you a book? Can you uh, have me on your show? Blah 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 blah. And I only bring on a select few of people who I can trust. Who, who preach the truth. So I'm, I'm recommending Jeremy's book. You can get it today. It's on Amazon. If you have a Kindle Unlimited, you have no excuse not to read it because it's free. And it's really reasonably priced, $9.99. That's a couple, couple of Starbucks coffees, man. Put them aside this week. Pick up some biblical truth and drink in some deep, deep truth. Or if you're one of these people that love the hardback copy books, you can get that Monday links to jeremy's uh amazon page is found in the description of this show before we go man how can people reach you on the web how can uh people reach out to you and talk to you personally tell them a little bit about the remnant report in case they've never seen your show how can they find you online absolutely um you can uh you can catch the remnant report uh, usually uh every friday uh it's recorded so you can actually watch the Omega Frequency and the Remnant Report. There's no excuse not to watch them both. They're both recorded. Um, the Remnant Report, however, we're not on YouTube. We're exclusively on the Next Chapter Radio Network, which is ncrnetwork.com. The Remnant Report is ncrnetwork.com forward slash SDR. And also on the next chapter radio network, you have Mary Callie and Tori Lyon with the deception report. And, you know, they bring, <laughs> they bring out and break out truth that is happening in the world with a biblical perspective, a biblical point of view. And, um, you know, we've started this uh, discipleship class to help people learn how to share the gospel, spread the gospel, because that is so important right now in these last days, man. Um, and to reach out to me personally, you know, you can find me on Facebook. Um, my, uh, my Facebook profile name is uh, Jeremy Redeemed Anderson. Um, you can also find me on uh, Serpents and Doves Ministries on Facebook. Uh, you can reach out to me on Messenger on Facebook. You know, I talk to people all the time on Messenger. I I don't ever usually, um, I always usually accept message requests and friend requests unless it's from, you know, some of these people who use Christianity just to uh, try to scam people or, or get money. But other than that, you know, uh, if somebody sends me a friend request, I accept it. Um, somebody reaches out to me on messenger i talk to them you know i, I pray with people all the time on messenger uh, people will call me on messenger and we'll pray um I, I tell you what man the lord facebook has got its faults and it is 
definitely can be used as a device of the enemy. But I have met so many very close brothers and sisters in Christ from Facebook. Um, you know, really, uh, that's the way you and I connected, even though, you know, I had followed your program and then uh, I was on NCR Network, uh, Facebook and Messenger is how you and I first connect. So, you know, it, it really is. Uh, it can't. God uses everything for good, even the things that the enemy means for evil. But uh, yeah, anybody can reach me there. Um, uh, I can put. I, I tell you what, I'm going to do. I'm going to put it in the chat. I'm going to take and uh, I'll put the the website in the chat, and I'll also put the link to. Um, well, I'll put the link to the website, and I also put my Facebook information in the chat as well, so people can just go in the chat and find it. Amen. Uh, the chat blowing up. I'm just going to say this because um, I don't want to cause a bunch of confusion for everybody in the chat. Those who are watching the chat replay live, do not worry about what Froggy said in the German. I know what that's about. Um, it's not the first time we've run across it. Uh, don't get concerned about it. Don't. Uh, it's something that gets triggered. I'm not going to talk about it because there's privacy issues, things going on. It just means that Froggy needs prayer. So pray for Froggy. Um, I didn't catch it. Yeah, I, I catch it because it's part of something that I'm working with. But uh, just pray for Froggy. Don't worry about the German stuff. Um, just don't. It's, it's just something directed at me by something that gets triggered sometimes. So pray, just pray. Don't, don't freak out. Pray, don't freak out. Anyways, God bless you all. Jeremy, thank you again for coming on. Um, love you, brother. Love you Take too, care, man. get Correct. some rest, and go with God. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. The grace and peace. Amen. Amen. Keep God first and you'll never be last. Keep your faith and keep your family and get your house in order.